it's fastly coming in America. In fact, there's an atheistic group right now that's working to get all of the Bibles uh, removed from, uh, from hotels, motels, doctor's offices, everything. Because they say, well, that's an offense to me. That's an offense. Now, if, if it's true, but it isn't what they say, if they believe it just to be a book that's filled with myths and it's just like another storybook, then why are they working so hard in order to get it out? Why do they work so hard to keep from uh, courthouses uh, displaying the Ten Commandments and, uh, and, uh, and all of this? And they say, oh, it's a, it's a, matter, of, it's a matter of separation of church and state. But the truth is, our Constitution itself is different from all of the Constitutions that have ever been written or ever put into operation. And the reason is, ours is the only one that was based on the Bible. That's what makes it different. The men that put it together, they were following a, a biblical uh, principle. That's why your unalienable rights come from where? Not from Washington or not from government or not from wherever, but from God himself. That's why that you have those rights in America because they looked in the Bible and they came up with that man is supposed to be free. And wherever the Bible has gone, eventually, Man receives not only spiritual freedom, but he receives uh, a physical uh, freedom as well. We're the, only, we're the only country that has what we have. And one of the, and one of the best things uh, that can happen is that, uh, uh, that just, take, uh, just take someone that, that uh, that says, oh, this is all, you know, this is bad, this is that, that's, 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 that. Okay? Just take them over in some of these other countries that weren't based on the Bible. That they, that their rules and regulations, if they have a civilized society, it has been based on the Ten Commandments that was found in the Bible. There's no other book that tells uh, governments and nations uh, that you need, if you're going to be a civilized society, if you're going to be able to function, then uh, here's, here's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to practice these things. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not. And you go down the list. Those thou shalt are creating for you a decent place to live. They're creating for you and for me a place where we can have things and someone not come in and take them away from us just because they want to do that. That is, that is what we have in the greatest uh, treasure we find. We have the treasure and the freedom uh, to read and to use the Bible and to preach and to teach it. And so therefore, we enjoy this freedom, this special freedom that we have. So when you hear them, uh, saying, well, you know, it's better, it's better over here, over here in this country. Listen, when you, when you get into some of those situations just in travel, going through them, you know, I know what it's like to come out of Egypt and after being there for a few days, look up and here is a big American airplane with an American flag on the side of it. 
and I, and we'd been going through the desert, and we'd been out uh, doing things in Egypt, and they have their flag, and they have all of that. But let me tell you, when you see the American flag, if it doesn't do something for you, when you're over now, it'll do something for you when you're over there in some of those other places, because then you remember what we have. Uh, to enjoy, all because that we have the greatest treasure that has ever been. The Bible is the true university. There's only one absolutely true uh, university. We look up to uh, universities and colleges and places of of what we say, well, that's, that's places of higher learning and everything, but the highest learning is the Word of God. You could have all of the degrees of every college and university in the world, but if you, but, but if you do not have a knowledge of the Bible itself, you are still without what you need in order to function as a human being. That's the way it is. God had a purpose in giving us a book. And so therefore, the Bible, it is the, it is the best book. Of, it is the, the book of history because outside of the history of the Bible, uh, we, don't, we don't know where we come from. We don't know where we're going. We don't even know why we're here to begin with. So you take the Bible out of all of that, then you don't know anything. <laughs> all you have is just someone saying, well, you know, I think it was like that. And you got all of these different groups saying different, I think. But you have one sure source of information, and that is, is the book of God. That is, that is the Bible. That is the greatest find of all times. If you had all the wealth in the world and you didn't have the truth of the Bible, all of that wealth would just be temporary because what we need is not, not just temporary. Uh, knowledge, but we need eternal knowledge because I and you are eternal uh, persons. We're going to live forever and ever and ever. So therefore, I need not only to know how I'm to live uh, now in this life, but I need to know about the life to come and what God has in store for us in the future. So, uh, so, so we have the map, the Word of God. Now I want to show you uh, just a few verses here that the Bible has a code. The Bible itself has a code. And when you decipher what that code is, then then the Bible will, will not just be a book on the coffee table that's respected but isn't put to practice because the, because the Bible itself gives you the code. And so uh, here it is. Look at John chapter 5. John chapter 5. In verse 39 and 40. Now Jesus was in discussion here, as he often was, with the disciples. Usually there were some Pharisees or Sadducees, the religious leaders of the day that would come and 
and would try to find some reason to accuse him. And so Jesus said one day in verse 39, reading from verse 37, And the Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his face. And you have not his word abiding in you. For whom he has sent, him ye believe not. Jesus is speaking. Verse 39. Search the scripture. Go on a treasure hunt. Search the scriptures. For in them ye think that ye have eternal life. Now these were the people who were opposed to Jesus. They were the authorities on the scriptures of that day. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes. They were the interpreters of the scriptures uh, uh, to the people and for the people. And Jesus is saying to them, you better look in the scriptures because they are those that speak of me. In other words, you have the scriptures, but you've missed me. That's what he's saying unto them. Verse 40, and you will not come to me that you might have life. So he's saying to them, he's saying, look, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. Jesus said, I'm what they're all about. You ought to know. Now, when, when Jesus says here, search the scriptures, now, what, what, is, what is he referring to? When he says search the scriptures, we have what? One Bible. It has Old Testament and it has New Testament, right? That makes up this black book, Old Testament, New Testament. Now, Jesus is speaking of what? Of the Old Testament. Because the New, the New Testament hadn't been written. It was in the process of being written. In fact, that's what John's gospel is. What Jesus was doing and teaching right then. So he says, search the scriptures. Because they are they that speak of me. Now, growing up, this area here, hometown area for area for me, the tri-state area, all of this. I hear people, and I've heard them since I was a child, and they'd say, well, you know, I don't, I don't read, I don't read the, I don't read the, the old Bible. I don't read the Old Testament. I just read, I just read the New Testament, you know, and uh, that's, you know, that, you know, that sounds, you know, all right, sounds pretty good in a way until you get to looking at what they're really saying is, what if, what if those in Jesus' day had said that? Well, I don't read the Old Testament. I just read what? They wouldn't have had anything to read, would they? Because what you have is, in the Old Testament, if you want to say Old Bible, some use that term, the Old Testament, up to Matthew's gospel, it, the Old Testament ended with Malachi the prophet. 400 years in between that and the writing of the New Testament. So you have the Old Testament. Jesus was speaking here of the Old Testament. He said, in the Old Testament, you can find me if you look for me. It, in fact, he's saying to them, you should have known because you had the Old Testament.
that spoke of me. Now here's a little saying, if you have a, if you have a pen there, I'll try to get it straight, and then uh, you try to write it straight, okay? If you write down this, that, here it is. The Old Testament, or just put O-T, the Old T is in the New T, N T. And then write the word concealed. That means covered over. The Old Testament, in the Old Testament, you have the New Testament concealed. Now, in the New Testament, this is the, the next line. In the New Testament, you have the Old Testament revealed. Tells you what it was all about. What it, what it, what the tabernacle in the Old Testament, 28 chapters in the Old Testament. You got two chapters uh, basically uh, that speak of the creation of the world and the universe, but yet in Exodus you have 28 chapters that deal with the tabernacle in the wilderness. Where is the, where is the, where's the balance there? Well, the balance is this. It only took two chapters or less to, uh, to tell us about the world. But in the tabernacle, it is all about Christ. It's all about Jesus. And we find out later in the New Testament what those, he was the golden candlestick. He was the bread of showbread. He was all of these different things. But in the Old Testament and the people that lived in that time, it was sort of concealed from them. Now we know that this is true because Peter says that even the prophets themselves, they wrote down certain things that God told them to write. And then they wondered about, <laughs> now what does this really mean? Well, it wasn't time because what they wrote down was it wasn't meaningful to them at that moment because God was not revealing. He had them write that down for us who would come at a later time and would get the full benefit of what they had written. So, so, so we have this thing of the scriptures, Old Testament and New Testament. Okay, look at Luke. Chapter 24 and verse 25. And this really makes it come to life. Jesus has been crucified. He's rose from the dead. He hasn't yet ascended back into heaven. He's in a body now that can walk through doors without them being open. He is walking up on the earth. He spent 40 days and nights on the earth after his crucifixion before he ascended to heaven. And there are two disciples the day or the morning after the resurrection and they're walking along uh, this road and they're talking with each other about the things that, uh, that have happened, his death, his crucifixion, in the last few days up at Jerusalem. And as he walks along, a stranger comes and joins in their company, walks along with them. And as they, and, and as they walk along, they say, he asks them, he said, uh, you know, what's, what's all of this discussion about, you know? That, and they said, don't you know? Uh, the events uh, that have taken place, that 
at Jerusalem, how that Jesus, this, this teacher, this one we thought was the Messiah, uh, that uh, they crucified him. And this is the third day. Now, and their hearts were saddened because they didn't know who had joined their crew. Their little fellowship as they walked along. And so Jesus says to them here, after a certain point, they said to him, well, there were certain women which went to the sepulcher and found that uh, it was even as others had told them, but, but they saw him not. And then, and then look at verse 25, Luke 24, 25. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart. We would say, you dense ones, you know, you, you fools, you slow of heart to believe what? What had they been slow to believe? All that the prophets had written. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Michael, go all the way back, going all the way back. That spoke of him and of his resurrection. Know what he says. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? He said, in other words, the prophets made it plain enough that you should have known Isaiah, when he wrote Isaiah 53, he spoke about me. David, when he wrote Psalm 22 and spoke of crucifixion, which had not even come into being at that time yet, the Romans mainly would, would, would use this hundreds of years later. But David in the Psalms, speaks of this one who's to come and how he is to die. He's saying to them, don't you know who he was talking about, who they were talking about, who they were presenting in all of this? Verse 26, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to do what? And to enter into his glory. Rise from the dead. Preparing and getting ready to ascend back to heaven. Jesus is saying to them, look, this is what it's all about. This is what the Old Testament was all about. It was about me. And so, he's saying, verse 27, and beginning at Moses. Now, we say Moses, first five books in the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all, that, all the way down the line. The books of Moses, the books of the law. That is what Jesus is saying. They spoke of me. It was concealed. Yes, <laughs> to a certain degree. But there should have been enough that you should have known. But they didn't. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the what? In all of the scriptures, Old Testament, in all of the scriptures, the things what? Concerning what? Who? Himself. Himself. So, boy, wouldn't you like to have been there? Out of all the sermons that, that I've heard in my lifetime, 
out of all of the messages that I've heard on radio and television and in churches and camps and everywhere, this is the one I would have liked to have heard the best and the most. Because a little bit later, they say, when he revealed who he was to them, they said, my, did not our hearts burn, heavenly heart burn, did not our hearts burn within us when he explained to us who he was and how that the scriptures spoke of him in all of this concerning himself. Now, jump down to verse 44. He's been up. He has met different groups of them, different ones. He has eaten with them. And they're having a little problem putting all this together. Verse 41, and while they yet believed not for joy, they had not yet come to the full revelation of who he was. And wondered, he said unto them, have you here any meat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and of honeycomb. And he took it and did eat it before them. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, that's the first five books, and in the prophets, that's in all the other writings, and in the Psalms concerning who? Who does it say? Me. Jesus said, they're all about me. They're all about me. The new was in the old concealed, but now the new, the old is in the new, made fully known. And, there, and then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. So that's what Jesus did for them. And you know what? We have the whole New Testament, how he makes it known unto us. The whole picture. The greatest book that was ever written about the greatest person who ever lived or ever will live. The complete record of all of that we need to get from earth to heaven, he has revealed unto us. And the Bible is the map. And Jesus is the secret code word. This is what the book is all about. All of it. The books of Moses, the Psalms, the prophets, the New Testament, Peter, Paul, James, John, all is about him. Romans, 1 Corinthians, Revelation, all about him. It's all about who? It's all about him. So here is the treasure. Here is the treasure. He made it very simple. It's just this simple. 
He has given us the book. You're blessed that you can read the book. There have been people that have lived and died that could not read the book. Either they didn't have it in their language or they couldn't read nor write. But you have been blessed. You have the book. You have the key to the book. And the key and the code is a person. And that person is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the creator. He's the one that made all things. He's the one that came down and took upon himself human flesh and took your sins and my sins and paid the price by shedding his own precious blood on the cross, rose from the dead victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And now he says, go into all the world and tell them about me. And that's what they did. And that's where the New Testament church came from. And 2,000 years later, it's still going on in this church and in other churches, the message that Moses had. But Moses didn't understand it in its fullness like you can. And yet we who have the key and the code continually neglect and read and spend our time and everything in so many other ways than going uh, to the real source that God has provided for us in the beginning. And he, and he made it this simple. He said, if you will read the book, What would it be like? Uh, what would it be like uh, to be without television? Can't imagine that. Or to be without, let's say, technology that we have today. Do you know that for 1800 and 1900, And almost uh, uh, 2,000 years, uh, people lived without all the benefit of that. And those that could read and had the Bible, they were blessed more than we are today with all of these conveniences and all of these things that time saved. They spent more time reading the reading the Bible because often in this area right here one of the first members of this church every night he would sit down and he would read so many chapters in the Bible after everything else was done that's the way the pioneers did it that were Christians in this country they didn't have all these other distractions and these other things that, to take up their time and all of these events and things to, uh, they had time, but they spent more time because they had to spend more time in order to live and to make a living than we do today. And yet they were blessed in that they had time for the book. And this dear Christian man here in this community, one of the first members of this church, had read the Bible through 90 some times. Now, he was blessed. You could sit down and you could talk to him, and he was a man of knowledge about, about the Bible, but about things that you learn in the Bible that you don't learn anywhere else or you don't get anywhere else. If it was a choice between having all of the degrees in the world and not having the Bible, you would be more blessed if you just had the Bible and didn't have all the other. Because of this, you're not a fully educated person uh, just because of, of the degrees uh, that you have 
Otherwise, why have the best educated people in America got us in the mess that we're in today? And it seems like the more educated uh, that we become, the bigger the mess gets, you know? You say, well, uh, that will keep you from, uh, that, will, uh, that will cause you to obey laws. You know what we found out? We found out that an uneducated man will break open a boxcar on a train that, that stopped out here and steal stuff out of the boxcar. If he has enough education and he climbs high enough, as one man did, who stole the whole Pennsylvania Railroad from top to bottom. I mean, he, I mean he, he, was such a, he was such a schemer that he got control of that much wealth. Now, so there's no morals uh, that are connected with all of this. Charles Coatson, a well-known individual that, that goes back to Nixon and his government, and he went to prison over Watergate and all this, a very educated man, a Harvard graduate. A few years before he died, he was later head of a prison ministry that did a great work. And before he died, he went back to Harvard and he said, we've got too many crooks that are coming out of the business department. What, what, they're Harvard graduates, but they don't have any morals. They don't have any scruples. They're just plain downright crooked. So he came up with the idea that he would endow, he would raise the money and have them set up a department at Harvard uh, to teach ethics. So he raised the money, he got the, and they got the teachers, and guess what? They did it one year, and then they quit. Now, what does that tell you? So much for ethics, doesn't it? Then we wonder why, why, that some of our best educated people today are a bunch of, are a bunch of crooks, you know? Well, they're educated, that's why. They can get by with it. They can get by. You, you would go, right now in this country, you would go to jail and go to prison for something that, that some of them get by with because it seems like the law don't apply to them. And this is not being political, this is just stating a, a fact. You, you, uh, you try it and you'll find out. You'll, you'll be sitting down here at uh, wherever, <laughs> you know. You know, saying, well, I didn't, you know, well, what I did wasn't anything compared with what they're getting by with up there now. Yeah, well, you got caught and you got put in, you got, <laughs> you got, you got persecuted or prosecuted or whatever, but they got by with it, see. So, so <clears throat> without, without, without the Bible, and without, because morals comes from Christianity and from the Bible. That's where morals come from. And that's why America has been great. But the problem is now, we have, we have removed the moral element in this country. And it's whatever you can get by with. Be you rich, poor, little, whatever. That's the message. That's why we're becoming a lawless uh, a nation. We have, we have rejected the lawgiver. And when, a, and, and when a nation says no to God and to his word and to what made America great, then America will get what made America what will make America bad, and it will not be good news. But Jeremiah said, even in dark times, he said, thy words were found, and I did eat them. 
And they became unto me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. So regardless of what, you need to hit the book. And you need not just to take it in, in little uh, tidbits or mincemeat. In other words, here's the way not to have your devotions. Well, I've only got five minutes, and I'm in a hurry. And I, and I want something, Lord, from your word, and I'll, I'll crack the book, and wherever it comes open, I'll read what it says, and, I'll, uh, and Lord, I'll pray. Lord, give me a good day today. Lord, bless, bless me, bless mine, bless my family. Amen. Got to go. See, a lot of Christians, that's all we've got. But what we need to do, we need to get in the book, and we need to read the book, and we need to meditate in the book, and we need to put it in practice in our lives, and we will be wise, and we'll be able to make the right decisions instead of the wrong decisions. We'll be able to do that which is right instead of that which is wrong. Now, people say, look, I read the Bible, and I don't understand it. Well, there's one degree that you have to have. If you don't, you see, well, Brother Earl, you said, I didn't have to have a university education or college education. One degree that you have to have, and that's a BA degree. What degree is that as a Christian? That is born again. In other words, it's a spiritual book, and you have to be a spiritual person. In other words, the person who wrote the book was the Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible teaches. The Spirit of God moved upon holy men, and they wrote the book. It wasn't written just by men. It, men were used in order to write it, but the Holy Spirit was the author. And he's one of the persons of the Trinity. So the Holy Spirit says, I gave you the book, and I'll teach you the book. In fact, John says in John, in 3 John, in 1 John, that uh, you need not that any man uh, uh, teach you. In other words, if you have teachers, and God provides teachers in the Bible, for you and for me, and we enjoy them, and they're provided in the church for us in order to help us and to instruct us. But if you didn't have one teacher, the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, you could, you could read the Bible, and the Lord himself would teach you. And so it is. And so it is. We find people that have been taught by the Spirit Never been educated. I remember one well-known preacher saying, uh, he said, I can't, I can't understand this man. He said, he's never been to any kind of school. He said, he's never, now, now, the, now the guy could read and write, but, he, but he, said, he said, look, he said, this fellow, he said, he's been to no seminary. He's been to no Bible college. He said, he just reads the Bible and lives what he reads. He said, I have never met even an educated uh, uh, seminary graduate with degrees, PhDs, whatever, that knows the Bible like this man does. He said, I'm just, I'm just amazed. Well, we shouldn't be. Does, doesn't, uh, he, prob he probably didn't have those opportunities that others have. So therefore, he took what he had, the word of God. The Holy Spirit that was given unto him, who wrote the book, was able to teach him the, the, the book. G. Campbell Morgan, a great Bible teacher and preacher who often came to America, he was from England, pastor a large church there, who often came to America and spoke. He has some great commentaries on the Bible, G. Campbell Morgan. 
He preached for D.L. Moody and some of these uh, men of a hundred years ago. Great man. And a man who was later used of the Lord greatly went to him one day and said, and said, Brother Morgan said, I'm amazed at how much you know the, of, the, of the Bible. Where do you get these things from? And he said, and he said, he said, well, John, I'd tell you, but you wouldn't do it. And he said, hey, I said, yes, I would too. And this was a guy that would do it. I mean, he was just that kind of a fellow. Because everything he went after, he went after it full force. He said, well, he said, the first thing I do before I ever, before I ever uh, uh, preach or teach on a book in the Bible, he said, I, I read it through 50 times. 50 times. Well, that, you know, that tells you a whole lot right there, doesn't it? So, uh, so this fellow said, I did what he said. He said the only difference was I took what he told me and I did it 50 times. But he said I used it to, uh, to memorize a lot of books in the Bible. And the way I memorized them was I read them 50 times. And he said you read them you take a book in the Bible, and I'll challenge you to do this, be it small or be it large, and you read it through 50 times, and you think about what you're reading, and the Holy Spirit will be, will be telling you some things that you need to uh, 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 line up with as you read it. And you know what? You will be amazed. And other people will be amazed at how much that you know, how much that you understand, and how much that you have. And for, the, and for the benefit of the young men and the young women who are here, there was a lady in Germany whose name was Ida Jongerman. Ida Jongerman was a teacher of preachers in England. But they taught the wrong thing. They taught what harmed uh, preachers and churches more than it helped them. Even though we sent uh, uh, preachers from America to Germany to be taught by her and her, her fellow teachers, she was one of the great names and book writers they used her books in order to in order to uh, teach in in seminaries around the world and the thing about it is they're still being used in America to train some of our of our preachers in liberal churches and in liberal seminaries and then you wonder where they got their wild ideas from some of them they got from her and her and her fellow teachers, her cohorts. They were the, they were the leaders of, of what's called higher criticism. It destroyed uh, the churches in England, and it, and it destroyed a lot of our mainline uh, uh, denominations, and that's why that they're empty today, these big churches that are just shells of buildings in this area right here that used to have seven and 800 people, you just go down Main Street in any of these towns, they built those churches when they preached the Bible and believed the Bible and saw people saved. That's why they had to have those big churches. But today, there are just a few people left in them because they're just hanging on to keep them closing the door because they no longer believe what they believed then and they no longer preach what they preached then. And so therefore, they were deceived by what was known as German rationalism or higher criticism of the body. That's the simplest way of telling me what happened when all of these churches at one time, at least they all believed in the virgin birth and the blood atonement and believed that, that the Bible was the word of God. But now, not so. Not, not so. So, so, she retired. 
she was called a success. She retired. She got to stay at home in her retirement, watching soap operas on television and drinking alcohol. She became an alcoholic. This woman that was held up as a great teacher of German higher criticism, books sold all over the world, still used today, some of them are. But guess what? She heard of a Bible class. And she was in such a mess herself now. All this knowledge that she had and she talked to others sure hadn't done much for her. So now she starts going to this Bible class. The pastor of the church, he got sick. And there was a young man who had not been to any of their school. Her, what she taught in, any of them. He was feasting, he was studying, he was in the word. And they asked him, would, would, would he take the class? And she sat there in amazement at what this young man brought out of the Bible. He only had the Holy Spirit. That's all he had to, 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 to teach him. In fact, they were hoping that the pastor wouldn't get well that had been teaching the class so this guy could go on teaching it. And guess what? Eva got saved. Brother, I mean, she really got saved. Guess what she did? She went back to her faculty and to the fellows that she had written books with and, and she told them, she said, look, that we were on the wrong track. Said, God has wonderfully saved me. And she said, I took all of my writing. I mean, this was a woman that wrote for magazines and everything and had file cabinets full of material and stuff, plus her books. She, and she took her books and her writings, and she put them all in a big pile, and she set them on fire. And she repented. This is, these are her words. She repented of the young men and the young women that she had led astray over the years in turning them away from the Bible instead of to the Bible. And she witnessed to her faculty, her fellow faculty members, and some of them were great names and still are in higher criticism. They still teach that same, same stuff. It still destroys churches just like it did then. And you know what she did? She went with Wycliffe over in Indonesia and spent the rest of her life working in translation of the scriptures and of the Bible. Now, when Paul says, it's not by man's wisdom, but by the Spirit of God and the Word of God, we can see this is what she found out. She thought it was her wisdom when she looked at the Bible, she said, well, this is what I think it means. Didn't make any difference what it said or what Jesus said. But she had the reputation of being in this elite group of higher criticism authority because she had written the book. She said, this is what I think it means. But the day came when she said, I can see now that that's not what it means. That was what I thought it meant. That's what I took out of my intellect and made it say. And so therefore, God wonderfully and gloriously saved this woman. And she bore fruits, meat for repentance. In other words, when she piled up those books and all those articles and, and all those things that she had written over the years, she was saying, this was the pride of woman. 
This was the pride of man. This is what I did in pride and in my own mind. It wasn't what the Spirit of God had done. And so therefore, boy, what a, what a challenge to us. What a challenge that that, that that young man was. That here, hey, he won the highest critic in higher criticism just because he began to feed himself on the word of God and to read the word of God and to apply it in his own life. Because Ezra said, it says of Ezra, Ezra 5.10, that Ezra, that he, he sought the will of God in the word of God, and he obeyed what he sought. And then he taught in Israel. So before we teach others, we need to, we need to get in the book. We need to seek the law of the Lord. We need to apply it to our own life. And then we need to go out and to teach others. And everyone said, amen, amen, amen. amen. Man, thank you, Brother Sammons. Um, you know, that message got me thinking. Just, you know, sometimes I think we can, uh, you know, take for granted having God's word, you know, in our in our lives daily. Um, you know, it's just a very humbling message. Um, you know, you think, you know, there's people throughout this world who, you know, who would love, you know, just a copy of God's word. And like Pastor Sammons says, you know, we've got several in our homes that, you know, sometimes we just take for granted and we'll go home and set it down on the, you know. On, <clears throat> on the counter and we won't pick it back up again until we come back to church but you know just a very humbling message so thank you Pastor Sammons um, but if we can get our ushers back up here we're going to take up a love offering for Brother Sammons you guys can just go ahead And if everybody will stand, uh, Brother John, Marcel, will you dismiss us? Thank you.